this, this is part of our, you know, every three to six weeks, weeks sort of scientific review, and, and Neil started off the program going over um, sort of our focus on the gene target, target the target. And I'm going to be similar, Neil, but I'm going to start to provide you examples of some of the um, activities that we've seen and, and, and use um, and share with you sort of how these therapeutics are developed in the preclinical side, on the clinical side, and what we do at Mary Crowley to sort of assess in, in our role. So um, the whole thinking behind setting up Mary Crowley was to try to get into a situation where we could um, identify signals, use therapies that act on those signals, and create change in cancer growth patterns as a result of modifying those signals and, and then prevent it from recurring. That's where the immune system comes on. And so we kind of called that the one-two punch. Um, and my grandfather was actually a boxer. He was a Golden Gloves champion. He came over from Lithuania when he was 13 and didn't have parents to raise him. And so, so, um, so the one-two punch was kind of an idea of mine to call it this. But, um, but the real purpose on the next slide is to control cancer growth. As we all know, when patients present with cancer, they have rapid cancer growth. Oftentimes, they're symptomatic. You need to get a quick hit in there. That's the one part. And then the frustration that we all have in, in cancer management is, is that um, it'll recur or it'll progress after you get initial stabilization. And oftentimes, it's a short period of time. So, um, so we need to also control the after effect. And that's where the immune system comes in. So it's a quick hit on the cancer with an immune control afterwards. And I'll get into why and how we're doing this. So, um, so our idea of target the target, you know, we didn't know what cancer was in the 1500s, and um, we weren't real safe with therapy, and as you can see in the 1500s, it was especially dangerous. Um, we got a little bit better, you know, 10 years ago, where we're starting to focus therapy, where we use lipids to deliver chemotherapy, so to say. Doxol would be a good example, Abraxane, Zolota. We're trying to minimize its off-target effects, and we get better at targeting, but we're really not targeting the signal that is playing a role in cancer because we didn't know it until about 10 years ago. So on the next slide, today we clearly in practice have access to non-targeted chemotherapy, some access to targeted therapies, that would be Herceptin, that would be, you know, you know many of the target therapies, we're not hitting a signal target, I'm going to try to explain to you what that signal target is all about. Um, we've just gotten a great hit with the pd one the immunotherapy field now having a huge visibility in cancer management and now combination therapies derived from that moving forward. Um, surface protein targets are identified and therapies to target toxins to that or to actually impact that are, are now developing and we have um, internal signals, preliminary ones with BRAF and ALK and things like that. So, um, so you can see there's a lot going on today what we're doing at our center right now is to really focus the signal targeting and the strategic combination of immunotherapy approaches. So on the next slide, tomorrow, but what you guys are using today are to develop the technologies that are going to be used tomorrow in practice. And so um, the, the identification of molecular signals that play a significant role in the cancer growth and progression, we've already identified a couple. You, you kind of heard us talk about the CDKN2A, PPC3 wild type approach that Neil Sender helped us um, you know, work out. Um, the EWS FLI1 is, is a new one they're going to be telling you about as we go along. That's the driver gene of Ewing sarcoma. You guys have already seen a number of the Ewing sarcoma patients coming in. Um, and the strategic combination of immunotherapy afterwards where we have specific targeting immunotherapies like the PD-1 inhibitor, like Vigil, um, and, and, and novel targets um, as we'll be talking about a little bit later with MSH2 and DNA repair. You've heard just a little bit about it. I haven't explained that to you guys yet. Um, so that's what we're engaged in right now so that the field tomorrow in practice can actually involve exactly what's on this, this slide. Um, uh, focus on very relevant strategic targets and, um, and immunotherapy profits that are very targeting. Um, on the next slide, to give you an idea of what these relevant targets are, there are basically six key genetic programs that cancer cells utilize to um, um, uh, survive and um, um, uh, shown here are the list of these six um, effects. And so the targets and the pathways that we're looking for involve these six pro uh, approaches. If we stop one of them, we can stop the entire cancer from growing. Uh, and the next slide is um, a listing when we talk about target the target and targeted therapies. This is a list of targeted therapies that are already approved by FDA. 
It's already paying dividends. And the reason this field is able to develop, it, it's a little bit sad, but, but part of the reason is because pharmaceuticals can make money off it. But if they make money off it and it helps people, nothing wrong with that. Um, and so, um, but these are just the first edge of targeted therapies that are out there. But you can see, probably didn't even realize how many targeted therapies are already out there being used in practice. Um, our job is to develop better targeted therapies and things that last longer, more specific, less off-target effects. Um, so on the next slide, cancer molecular signaling is governed by a limited number of mutational events which create high-degree nodes. And I'm going to show you a map of what I mean by high-degree nodes. And when we talk about these signals, like P53, like CDKN2A, each signal relates to another signal. And some signals if you block it, there's a pathways around it. It's like a freeway in the marginal road. If you block the freeway, you can still go forward by going on the marginal road. But there are certain components, there are certain junctures in the DNA signaling pathway of all cells where there are very few aberrant pathways. And if you actually block strategic signals, they may not be the one that's mutated, it may be something downstream. But if it's a strategic signal where there's very little around it and you take that out of the picture, now you stop that pathway from going forward. It's sort of like if you've got a freeway spot and, and it's after one of our big rains and the marginal road is flooded out. Now you block the freeway, you've done something. You're like stuck. And that's what we want to put the cancer into. So that's what the bioinformatics guys do. They help us define which signals are strategic. Or if you block that one, there's very little chance of side passageway. Or if there is side passageway, you use combinations. You block this signal and this one and this one to get a complete blockade where there's no signaling around, okay? And so that's, that's the concept. If you look at this map where you see the balls, these are basically DNA signals. And you can see where um, if you block like that red one, you're really not going to significantly impact the cancer for a long time. If you block the gold one, you'll have some blockade, but, but again, there's passageways around it to still create, the, the enable that process to move forward. But if you block the blue and the green ones, you can inhibit one part of the signaling pathway from getting to the other dominant part and vice versa, and that's going to put that cancer cell now in disarray. You get what I'm saying by that? So it's sort of the junction points, the, the sort of the intersection points that you want to block and, and inhibit. But today, we don't have all the evidence. We've learned how to sequence the human genome. We've learned how to sequence in cancers. We can do this within just a couple days now. Just 15 years ago, it cost a billion dollars to do this, and it took us uh, 15 years. So, so, you know, we've really advanced, and who knows how much we're going to advance from here, but we're sitting at Crowley in a very, very strategic um, position for that. But we still have to rely on the best information we have. We're not always sure on which signal is the one to target. So on the next slide, some of you guys have seen this before, but to identify which signal is the most relevant one to target, many programs work on the consensus of literature that's out there, scientists that are out there, and in a consensus, there's not always 100% consensus. And so this is sort of just to give you guys a feel for consensus of what I mean by that. So some of the therapies we get, they work really well. Some, they work okay. Some, they don't work at all. You know, uh, we're not always on target. And that's what's frustrating sometimes about translational research work. But for you guys to think about this, let me just see how you answer this question. If you walk in this room, and for you guys who know this, like Jenny, Brenda, um, <laughs> don't, 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 don't say anything. Let the guys who don't know. If you walk in a room, and Shannon, if you walk in a room and, and you need to turn a switch off, um, um, which switch would you turn off to turn off that light? So how many people would turn off the first blue one? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, it could be the first light. How many people would turn off the yellow one? <laughs> okay, how many people would just get a drink? <laughs> I already did this with you. I know. I don't even know if you're right or wrong. How many people turn off the red one? Okay. A couple of right. So most people are not participating. Right. <laughs> and that's often how consensus is. So, 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 
so now, um, you know, the, the one thought that some had was if the red on the light bulb and the red switch, there may be a correlation there, Charles the Rabbit made it, but you don't know for sure. And when we go and we develop therapies and we're not, you know, we think based on the information we have that, that we, 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 we've learned what switch to turn off, okay, that's the signal pathway turning off, but we're not always sure. However, if we're in the clinic and we see the cancer shrink in one patient that has that gene, and we see the second patient come in with the same gene profile, and that cancer shrink. Well, if we get that information back to the scientists, and you turn over the next page, now how many people might take the red switch? We've got more information, but the most significant information you could ever develop on a therapeutic and how to understand how it works is the clinical response information. And so that's what's so important about this clinic. We're the first here ever for the therapy to go into the clinic. If that therapy is any life after us, oftentimes you need to have some evidence of benefit to the patient. And that's what's so important about us following the patient more closely. That's why the scans, that's why the blood tests, that's for all those things. And so um, to, to just give you a little summary, when we did this blinded and took people separately, um, it turns out that the majority of people asked which switch to turn off on the first one, not on the second one, um, did pick red. Um, as it turns out, on the upper right, red versus non-red, 57% um, of people we went to out of 79 picked the red, but 43% took non-red. So that gives you an idea of consensus. Consensus is always 100%. In fact, it was almost 50-50 here. It was kind of curious that on the second one, men versus women, that less than 50% of women picked the red one. And 70% of men, which makes me think that men have better consensus opportunities. And, but we don't want to go there. So, anyways, and then when I had my kids taken into school, um, it turns out almost 75% of the children got the red one, so the kids did better than all the adults. So, I'm not sure what that means either. So. I think the red is a biased color, though. It, it, it could be. Draw to your eyes. What about color blindness? And, and, and basically, all those people that didn't pick red had a lot of excuses. Like that. I don't know if Derek's on the line, but Derek picked orange. And he said, well, it's kind of like red and yellow mix. I wasn't doing fine, so I made it red. So, so anyways, um, but that's how consensus goes. There's a lot of debate. You're not always sure. And when we get in the clinic, that's what's so important about us understanding did reality happen? Who cares what all the consensus was before it gets to the patient? Did that patient, did any patient have any benefit? And if some, if one patient had benefit and the other 10 didn't, well, what was seen about that one patient? And that's what's so important about what we do, because we will find, we will see the first tier of getting that into the patient. That's what's so important about you guys noticing just the little things. I mean, just the other day, there was a woman with endometrial cancer just talking about getting a checkpoint inhibitor, and she had a bunch of squamous lesions all over her arms. Turns out the squamous lesions were shrinking all over the place. Well, then when um, Steve Phillips got me the, the DNA uh, uh, content, which correlates with the immune response to checkpoint inhibitors that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, it turns out squamous cancer with the highest proportion of 75% of, of them actually had um, a multiplicity of, of DNA mutations. More DNA mutations meant more tumor antigens, meant more opportunity for the immune system to attack it. So, you know, that's something we just noticed. So, no one else has noticed that. We may be writing that up as a case report, but that's, that's coming to the clinic. So, um, so the typical approach for developing targeted therapies, and now I'm going to get into an example of what I call the one-two punch that has developed over the years here, the Ewing sarcoma work. But to give you a general overview, typically when you initiate focus on a particular target, a particular gene target, it's a target that has some sort of prognostic indication to being relevant. In essence, you'll see a whole slew of cancer patients treated, it turns out all these RAS mutants do worse, all these RAS wild types do better. You'll, you'll find some prognostic issue that is, is, is involved. Then what happens is you identify that and you try to control that signal. And you see if when you control that signal in animal models, in cancer cells in the test tube, that's in vitro, that's in vivo work, um, whether you can indeed control the, the cancer growth by a therapy that will block that signal that had prognostic indicators of, of good response or poor response. Um, then, every therapy that controls gene expression has to get to all the cancer cells. If you just get into cancer cells you inject into, that helps help the rest of the sites of disease. So the delivery is real important. You can have a therapy that works great on controlling the gene, 
But if you can't get it to all the cancer cells, whether it's an IV delivery or whatever delivery it is, a viral delivery, whatever it is, an antibody delivery, um, it, it's not going to, it's still not going to help us. So we got to figure out when we're managing the patients. That's what all the pharmacokinetics work is about. That's what other blood tests are about. They're about, does the technology get to the tumor site? That's why the box is in narrow pharma trial are so important. But does it get to the tumor site? And if it does, does it appropriately deliver the therapy to where it needs to get to? With some therapies, it has to get to the nucleus of the cancer cell. Other therapies, just on the surface. Other therapies, just in the environment. So, um, but those are the tests that are built into studies when you see different blood tests and things like that. Um, then, if you do get it to all the cancer cells and it does do what it's supposed to do, well, does that translate to a patient benefit? Does the cancer shrink? Does the patient live longer? Does the cancer stabilize at least so they can live longer? Um, and those are things that we learn in the clinic. Um, is it safe? What are the side effects? So testing is done to assess that, and then once it passes all, you know, all the top five points there, um, um, the patient is now cleared to go into clinical testing. That's what an IND is. We define the top five in the IND, why it's relevant, how it works, why it's safe, what's the starting dose, and then that's when we get it into the clinic. That's why that's in green. <laughs> so, um, so one of the first examples that, that, that really impressed me was um, a wild type 53 gene approach. It was like, I don't know, maybe, maybe the second or third year that we set up the clinic. A lot of you guys weren't around at that time. P53 gene regulates cancer growth. It regulates um, DNA repair. In essence, if DNA mutations occur in a single cell, the P53 gene will initiate a process to repair it. But if it can't within that time period, it'll turn on another system called apoptosis and tell that cancer cell to grow. More than half cancers uh, that we see in patients have P53 gene mutations. And that was one of the initial dysfunctions that occurred in that normal cell to enable it to develop further mutations, not die off, and eventually the right mutations relate to cancer growth. So obviously in a, in a cancer that has a P53 mutation, if you can get the wild type P53 gene back into it and turn back on that system that the cancer lost, Theoretically, you should be able to do a response, okay? But we know with, with Dr. Chang's therapy in the pancreatic trial, there's a systemic delivery. You're trying to get it to all the cancer cells, but that systemic delivery is sometimes difficult to get into all the cells. So one way of making sure you get into all the cells is if you can inject it directly into the cancer itself. So there was a patient with lung cancer that had a large bronchial um, obstructing lesion um, the size of like half a pen allowed oxygen to get into it, on high doses of oxygen, desperate patient. Uh, um, um, Mac, uh, when he was a thoracic surgeon here at Medical City, actually managed the patient, and we went into the OR on a bronchoscopic exam. This patient had attempted laser therapy, but it cut through a bronchial airway. That wasn't real good, so, so we, we, we couldn't do laser therapy on this tumor. It was continuing to grow. It had P53 mutation, so we injected it with the wild-type P53 gene. It's the first patient ever treated. And you can see on the slides here, um, the uh, ball-sized lesion with a very little opening left um, on day zero. The, the day is on top. Um, then on day three with a second injection, maybe there's something changing, but it's hard to tell, different angle. By day 14, it's obvious after uh, there's a third injection given that the three injections that something's going on there. And by day 28, the cancer's completely disappeared. Two years later, that patient still had a completely clear airway. Her husband actually made the comment that within two weeks of this response, she started going shopping so much that he was having trouble keeping up with her. Again, I shouldn't be making one joke, should I? But anyway, so, um, so <laughs> moving on, um, it was a great response. It was a clear, classic example of the wild, of the wild type 53 gene taken on. She didn't have disease elsewhere, so that's why this was really, really, now most of our patients had disease elsewhere. It's hard to inject every lesion. Systemically, it's hard to deliver it to every lesion. That's why a lot of work is going on trying to find better delivery. Um, about three years later, she actually developed recurrent disease in the same spot. And it turns out when we revived her, it was cancer with a wild type BP3 gene. So probably there were a few cancer cells that were residual in that area that did not have the PC3 um, mutation, and they had other mechanisms that were able to allow it to grow into cancer uh, growth. And we uh, she, she actually responded to chemo at that point in time, uh, but then um, eventually did pass away after about five years. But you can see the proof of principle and how that mechanism might work. That's why 
this is the, the, the work put together by Megan and, and many of you guys. The signals in our patients, you can see 457 patients have signals identified. You can see the top 10 signals. Um, Megan and I are working very hard to get studies that would target each of these signals. You can see where many of them we already have targets towards. Um, CMYK, P10, uh, CDKN2A, you know, PI3 kinase, APC, APC, we don't have too many signals for actually, um, P53. Bottom line, we're trying to get to each of those. Probably to the top 20, and um, but we're trying to characterize a more rapid approach with FDA, where we feed just have patients just with the same target therapy, we can get more um, likely response. Um, shown here are the list of the molecular therapies. All of them are towards various molecular signals, and the new studies coming along. So it's not to study what they are; it's just to let you know the major focus in the targeted therapeutics that we're trying to develop. So, getting back to the one-two punch with that introduction. Um, is the Ewing sarcoma story. So before I ever wanted to come here and set up a clinical trial program, it was that concept. Can we find some way of controlling cancer growth and then preventing it from coming back? And I think in Ewing sarcoma, we probably have our first opportunity to begin to show that in sequence. And so, so let me try to show with you the Ewing sarcoma story, because some of you know some of it, some of you know none of it. Um, but Obviously, what we want to target is a cancer where there's a desperate need for therapy. Ewing sarcoma involves teenagers mostly. Um, and frontline treatment from Ewing sarcoma, for those of you who don't know, is multi-dose chemotherapy. And usually it's a year-long program. I mean, the kids are pretty sick going through treatment. The median time of relapse, unfortunately, is 1.3 years after starting therapy. So that's pretty quick. And so that therapy kind of gets you three-tenths of a year in many cases. Um, if Relapse occurs within two years, and 72% of the time, that's what happens. That kid's of high risk of um, mortality from the recurrent cancer, and their two-year overall survival is only 7%. So you can see the need for better therapy in Ewing sarcoma. Uh, Third-line treatment response is less than 10%, and survival is much worse than the 7% at two years. So that's the population that um, we're targeting in the vaccine trials of third-line patients, and that's most of the patients that will be coming on to the Nanoplex trial that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, the one thing that, like I told you with the consensus, you already saw how there's a lot of variables to consensus. Consensus on the gene target isn't always 100%, but there is 100% with Ewing sarcoma. That's created by the fusion of two different genes, the EWS gene and the FLI gene. They're normal genes in the body. They have normal function. But when they come together at a particular junction point, a new protein is formed. That protein is a transcription factor. It will bind to other genes in that cell that aren't receiving that protein normally. But when they receive it now, it turns on growth. It turns on metastatic spread. It turns on basically the principles of cancer of Ewing sarcoma. So, so that's how it forms. That's universally accepted. Everyone would pick red on that one. And, um, um, and so, so we know that. Um, in the vaccine approach, you guys know Carly. Shown here is a nice summary of her case. The, um, the two part of the punch actually ended up coming up before the one part of the punch. It's a technical glitch, I won't go into it, but it was because of the ease with which we could move the vaccine part through the FDA process versus the nanoplex part. We also had the assays developed to a higher level with the immunotherapy part, uh, and it was felt to be probably uh, a little bit easier to manage um, clinically and, and, and basic science-wise. But to give you a summary of her case, um, shown hers with her first injection. She had multiple tumors within her lungs. They were progressing. She was someone who had recurred um, within two years of getting her intense chemotherapy. Um, and on the right today, she has no evidence of disease in her lungs. In between, when we turn on the immune system, and this is the kind of work that we do in the clinic to get the samples, to get the information the FDA needs, which shows the correlation of how is this diet of this therapy made, how does it impact the body that would correlate with a significant benefit parameter. And so what we defined was the LA-spot assay, where we can detect those cells in circulation that will travel to the tumor, release toxins to the tumor, and kill the tumor cells. So the assay is on the left side of those little circle things. But also we want to make sure that those immune cells get to the tumor. So on the right, 
is that one of the tumor biopsies that she had after turning on the immune response where it's filled with the appropriate immune cells, dendritic cells in her tumor. Later, her tumor disappeared and she's now having clear PET CT scans. She finished her college. She's, that was about three years ago, maybe a little more than three years. She graduates in May. Graduates in May. She graduates in May. I'm assuming she'll finish college. So um, point is, is that you can see how it's working the way it's designed. It's one example. It's a nice example. You like to go to nice examples. Um, but, um, but I thought many of, many of you haven't seen some of the information from Carla. I thought we'd show one little video where she's sort of explaining it from her word rather than my or you guys. Is that okay? So let's watch her video. The new one that she just made. a very surreal feeling to think yesterday I was in English class and today I'm getting chemo. I'm Carly Rutledge and I live in Boulder, Colorado. I was 16 years old and I was told that I have Ewing sarcoma, which is a bone cancer. I think it first hit me really when my doctor told me I was going to lose my hair. And it sounds a little superficial, but as a 16-year-old girl, that's pretty traumatic. Your life just kind of gets put on pause and everyone else around you just keeps going. I mean, you want to go to the prom and go to the pool with your friends. You want to do all these things that your friends are doing around you, but cancer just completely stifles that. The hardest part about my treatment was the length of it. It took 11 months, 13 rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. That's how long I was separated from my family and friends. It was scary to learn that it had returned because I did not want to do chemo again. I didn't want to lose my hair again. I didn't want to be weak. I didn't want to lose my immune system. I just, I didn't want to do it again. And I just knew that there had to be something better out there. My mom was there from day one until the present. My mom did hours upon hours, days, weeks, months of research to find any other option that could save my life. Chemotherapy breaks down your immune system, your body's natural defense against cancer. Immunotherapy builds it. They take your cells, retrain your immune system to recognize the Ewing sarcoma, which previously went unrecognized from your immune system, flew under the radar. Now your body can recognize it and destroy it. The immunotherapy trial that I participated in was a part of Mary Crowley in Dallas, and it's called the Fang vaccine. It was really encouraging month by month to see no growth in it. After a few sets of scans, I started to get a lot more confident and really believe that this was working. I had cancer raging throughout my body, compromising my bones and my nerves, and they told me I would never walk normally again. I'd always have a limb. But now, four or five years out of treatment, I have been backpacking. I've traveled across the world. <coughs> So immunotherapy gave me everything. If you fit into the guidelines of the therapy trial, then, I mean, it could change your life. And we're excited because how many more people will this work for? How many more lives will it save? But I think that our bodies are your most powerful weapon. No toxic chemical that you can pump into your body is really going to do the trick. And the answer to fighting cancer is within your own immune system. My immune system, whatever it has learned from this immunotherapy, it will now know how to do for the rest of my life. And so her conclusion there, for the rest of her life, once we're able to activate the immune system, thus far, we've been finding that once it's turned on to respond to the cancer cells, it hasn't come down yet. She's three years later, her, her immune effector cells that are able to attack the cancer are still present at high levels in her blood. Same story with all the other patients uh, that have gone through the treatment. They haven't come down yet. That, that helps me gain in confidence that the two part of the punch that we envisioned was to prevent the cancer from coming on by, by enabling the immune system to gain a, a full strength is, is probably, we're probably on target. Um, not that this is the only therapy that we do in that. The checkpoint inhibitors help us. There's other immunotherapies that help us as we've already tested. Um, but it's, it, it's a way of thinking of the cancer technologies um, to, uh, uh, and the immune approach and how to prevent the durability. Now, one case shown here on the next slide is Andrew. I think some of you guys remember him. He had a, a beautiful response as well. Um, we just lost touch with him for a couple of days because he used to fish in, in mountain streams and stuff, but when his cancer got so 
advanced in his lungs. He, he couldn't breathe well enough to go up to high altitude. He, in fact, had to wear oxygen. So when he had his dramatic response, him and his dad shot off to the mountains, about 8,000, 9,000 feet elevation. And that's a picture his dad took of his son. He thought he'd never, ever see his son up in the mountains fishing again with him. I mean, his son did. After about a year, it did progress again. We didn't have a chance to treat him again, and um, he passed away. But his dad remembers that memory of, 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 of he thought he'd never be able to have him fishing again, and, and that was probably the best memory he's ever had. So we're trying to get it where it doesn't just stop after a year, and that's where the one, two part of the punch comes in. Um, the next slide is simply the, the pinkish peach color there are the Ewing sarcoma patients. The pluses are all still alive. These are all patients with fractures disease who have received in the phase one trial um, the visual fang therapy. And um, you can see the different kinds of cancers on the right. I think about 20 different kinds of cancers received therapy. Um, the expected time of survival, this is survival going out over days. You can see 2,000 days there, which is quite a long time, like almost five years. Um, the expected survival of the patient to come out of this trial that they failed standard of care and second line standard of care is typically around 180 days, six months. So you can see that around 200, and you can see how many bars are past that and still alive. So that's encouraging. And, 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 and the concept is prove principle one cancer type as well as you can, and then it can grow to affecting other cancer types by single agent, by combination, but you can see how we build therapeutic plans for, um, for practice outside. Um, the next slide. This is brand new data that we just analyzed. Um, I think you guys remember with some of these vaccines, we couldn't construct them because they got contaminated. There are too few cells in it. So um, what we decided to do is look at the patients who got the vaccine. These are just the Ewing's patients. And look at the patients who, who we couldn't make the vaccine on, but they fulfilled the same criteria. And it turns out that their survival was, um, you know, um, 24 months on a median versus almost a little less than seven months. That's a big difference. So the FDA saw that database, they were encouraged by it, and that's why the randomized study got set up. We're now interacting with the FDA to um, uh, understand what level of completion of that study would be needed or the entire study to potentially approve this so anyone in any practice can use it. Um, and it can be used then to combine with other therapies potentially. So, so that's the two part of the punch as a principle for Ewing sarcoma, and I think we're on track with, with, with evidence of, of safety and efficacy there. Um, this just shows, the next slide, the randomized trial design. Um, the one part is something that was just sent in two weeks ago. You haven't heard much about it. But I told you about how the gene forms. Normal EWS gene accidentally breaks at a certain point, and FLI1 gene wraps around where it breaks, and it reattaches, but the wrong ones reattach to each other. Okay? Um, that then stays alive in the cell. By itself, doesn't cause too much trouble at first, but eventually the protein that's made from that new gene is a brand new protein the cell's never seen before. That protein binds to other genes in the promoter region to cause those genes to behave in an abnormal way, to be turned on when they shouldn't be turned on, to turn on growth of that cell, and that's how the Ewing uh, sarcoma cell grows. When that cell divides, the divide protecting that translocated sequence, so now you have two cells with that, then four, then eight and then the cancer grows from there. 60% on the next slide, 60% of the Ewing sarcoma uh, cancers um, uh, have what's called type one. It breaks at point A and point B. <coughs> but there are other points where it could break and form a new protein that'll have the same effect. 25% uh, of the time that's called type two Ewing sarcoma. Um, the therapy that we're constructing only affects the specific break point. That's how specific and targeting it is. So it'll only affect 60% of the type 1 patients or 25% of the type 2. Um, this just shows in the next slide the design of therapy. I mean, I'm still amazed. I mean, you look in a microscope and you can't see these things, but uh, the assays have been developed to verify the sequence that's, that's linked up to block it. This is the biased HRNAI therapy um, that, that was constructed to bind to those translocation points. And when it binds to it, it'll break it apart, or it'll bind to it and stick to it. And when it sticks to it, it's an abnormal grouping of, of RNA that gets destroyed by the cell. So either way, through dual mechanisms, that's the by part. 
So typically, when you try to understand if this is going to be of value, you construct the therapy. Make sure you can repeatedly construct it. Um, you got to make sure if it has the effect you want it to have. So you take it in and you give it to the cancer cells in the test tube, and will it control that cancer gene? Shown here is cancer cells um, that that got the plasmid without this bias H, and cancer cells that got the bias H plasmid that was designed to block that. And you can see that their growth was markedly reduced by, um, and the protein expression was markedly reduced by 93%, which is very good for this kind of technology. On the next slide, um, you look at the, the growth of the cells, and the SK and MC are the Ewing sarcoma cells. Um, the HEK293 are normal cells. And so the Ewing sarcoma cells, you can see, when you get the empty vector, nothing happens to them. When you get 141, which is a bias H treatment that's targeting it, you'll get a marked a reduction in the survival of those cells. If you give the same stuff to uh, normal cells, you don't want to see adverse effects on normal cells, and we don't see that. So that shows it's targeting. It's not adversely affecting cells that don't have the EWS FLI protein sequence. The worry we had is all normal cells have the full EWS gene and the full FLI1 gene. So could this stuff go and hurt the normal EWS or the normal FLI1. And it turns out it's designed to not do that, but it didn't, and that's why the normal cells are doing fine. So even though we can control that gene expression in the, in the normal way by adding this molecule to it, um, you have to still get it to all the cancer cells. You can't just inject it into them. So on the next slide is the liposome delivery vehicle that is used. So on the next slide, that liposome delivery vehicle has the plasmid placed inside it. The plasmid is the thing that contains that bias H product that targets the EWS FLI. It'll fuse the cell wall and open up, release the plasmid inside. That plasmid within, we've already timed it, we've marked it and timed it, within in less than five minutes, we'll get to the nucleus. It's in the nucleus where it'll generate continuously the bias H DNA to mRNA product. And that RNA product is continuously made inside the cancer. So it makes its own sort of death tool. This is what we like for cancer. Um, the next slide is once we sh once you show how it works, you can look at how it works in animals that have the Ewing sarcoma cancer. So the way to look at this is look at day 28. The red line are the animals who got the empty vector that doesn't target anything, and the green line are the ones that got the uh, highest dose of the best vector that targets BS, uh, the 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 EBS. And basically, you can see that all the animals are alive at day 28, and none of them are alive if you've got the control on day 28. So that's a remarkable disparity in, 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 in and it shows the activity of the, of the technology. We do these studies with multiple vectors to see which one's the best one. So that was repeated three times in the same results. So on the final slide, all of that information goes into an IND. This picture is the 7,000 plus pages of the IND that was submitted to FDA two weeks ago, and it identifies all of the preclinical work, the design of the vector, the animal studies, the viability, the safety studies I haven't even gone into, um, and, um, and the manufacturing routine, where it'd be manufactured at, how to manufacture it. All that's defined in the IND. That goes off the FDA, and if they're comfortable with it, then they allow us to take it to the patients, and that's what comes to Crowley to treat the first patients. So, so the one-two punches now, I think, potentially going to be out there where we hit the cancer hard, hopefully block their signaling, and then prevent the cancer from coming back by, by stimulating the immune system to prevent it from coming back. So does that make sense? Do you get the one-two punch concept? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what questions do you have? 